Hi, this is Patrick Donahoe. Welcome back to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy Podcast. We are still in our summer season talking about the hierarchy of wealth, which is a tool to categorize and better understand the assets that you have and the assets that you want to make investments in. I'm joined by someone that I have a great deal of respect for. He is uh, an incredible person that has benefited my life in so many different ways. His name is Gary Pinkerton, and we're going to get into tier three. Gary has invested a lot in residential real estate. He has uh, a couple dozen properties and understands the value of tier two, but his properties and the amount of time and effort it takes to, to manage all of those has allowed him a big appreciation for tier three. So get ready for this awesome conversation. Welcome to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy Podcast. Hey, everyone. Thank you for uh, for joining me. And I am here with my uh, dear friend, Gary Pinkerton. Uh, Gary is in New Jersey right now, and uh, I'm in I'm in Salt Lake. And, you know, Gary and I have known each other for quite some time. And I consider him a, a, a friend. And he is one of the uh, most amazing people, the most the smartest uh, people I know, and he has done just an incredible job advising clients over the last uh, last several years. But for tier three today, I thought it would be appropriate to have Gary on because Gary uh, and I met through uh, an investment group, uh, specifically you know the real estate guys uh, summit at C, as well as a, a few other groups, mainly with Jason Hartman, uh, and you know it's been it's been awesome because you know Gary. Uh, came to you know came to Paradigm as a client and had an understanding a little bit of an understanding of what we do, but also had an intrigue and interest in uh, investing. And so he has been exposed to lots of different investments over the years, uh, personally and with clients. And and I know that that's where that's the you know that's where he plays. And I thought no one better uh, to talk about than uh, than Gary uh, in relation to the, the the purpose of Tier Three. Uh, what are tier three investments and how they relate to the overall hierarchy of wealth and the perpetual wealth strategy. Uh, but Gary, let's, why don't you take a minute and just, yeah, for those that have not heard you before, obviously you've been on the, uh, the the podcast several times as well as done other material. But for those that may not be familiar with you, why don't you give them a, a brief background uh, of you know your career and then how you came to uh, start being a wealth strategist at Paradigm Life? Sure. Thanks, Pat. So, uh, 2011, I'd never even heard of infinite banking, never heard of Pat Donahoe. Uh, it's been an amazing, amazing 10 years. Uh, I, uh, before that, um, you know, I grew up in Southern Illinois, really never been out of the Midwest, uh, dirt poor on a farm because it was a dairy farm and we were in high interest rates of the Jimmy Carter era and we lost the farm bankrupt. And it was about time for me to go off to college and Thankfully, I'd studied a lot, and I went to the Naval Academy. And so then I had a 26-year uh, Naval, uh, Naval submarine officer career, finished up command of, of the USS Tucson in 2011. Just a tremendous time. I really, really loved my time in the military. Would never, would never give that back. Um, as I was leaving the military, though, I had worn out the family, and I was looking for a new challenge. And a lot of things came together. I got extremely excited about real estate and personal finance. I'd been excited about personal finance my whole life. And those two led me to find the real estate guys and find Patrick Donahoe uh, advertising on real estate guys. And he's still doing it. Uh, and this thing called um, you know, wealth maximization account. And so I started in my own life in 2011. I was investing in one to four families. Susan and I did, uh, we have 20 properties now, one to four families. and. Then we grew past that and we grew into this tier three thing that I didn't know was called tier three. And I've had a tremendous life the last three or four years um, experimenting in that place. And it's been really, really, really good. Um, nothing though compares to the tier two asset, which is my own business working with Paradigm Life clients. So excited to talk about this topic and I'm honored to be on the show with you. Well, Gary, you know, it's, it's been an honor to, to see, you know, how much you have learned in regards to personal finance and uh, and how you've applied the principles uh, to the sp uh, specific clients that you work with, you know, I, I think there is an intrigue with these, you know, tier three assets, which we categorize as, you know, not having guarantees, uh, limited collateral, not much if any control. Uh, you're essentially relinquishing control to a to a professional. 
you know, the, these are the typical investments that people have, right? So what's been your experience yeah. talking about tier three and, and why certain investments are categorized that way when it comes down to, you know, con control and, and risk, which are the ways in which we uh, create those categories? You know, so I kind of, I, I liken everything to a car because I'm a huge car enthusiast, but I would say that um, tier three asset, you're just, you're in the backseat, right? You're, you're the guy who wants to be the backseat driver, but we all know that doesn't really work. Hmm. Uh, and if you, you know, so you, you need to pick who's driving that vehicle for you because your future's in their hands. That is a tier three asset. It's an asset that typically is what we call an alternative asset. So it's not on Wall Street normally. Um, and it's an asset where you have some insight, right? So you know who the individual is that you're investing with. You have an opportunity at least to sit in a webinar and ask some questions typically. Um, and in the end, though, you're, you're uh, pictured in this or you are a, a part of this as the backseat individual. You are what's called a limited partner. And, and so you're not making the decisions, right? And as you go up that hierarchy of wealth pyramid, every time you go up a new tier, you're giving up some control and some insight for, and, and that results in more risk. You know, we write control um, and control versus risk kind of on the scale. I talk to people all the time though that the reason you don't have control most of the time is because you don't have insight. So yeah, you may know where the property is and you may even be able to go drive by it. Uh, and you know the person who's syndicating and you know their, their phone number and their, and their address or whatever and their email address, right? And you get reports from time to time. Um, but if they stop giving you the reports, if they, you know, so there's risk there, right? Um, it's all about the people. Like I think everything in life is about um, never do a good deal with a bad person, right? So it's finding the good person. That's the most important thing. It's not about the deal. Uh, I have some people in my life. You know, he's, uh, one is uh, is Dave Zook. So Dave Zook, real asset investor, is a guy who's been on the podcast many times. And with Dave, um, I've spent years developing that relationship. And um, I would trust the guy with just about everything I have. And he's in, in a very small group with Patrick Donahoe and some other people like my friend Aaron Chapman, that I would just, if they say this is the right thing to do, I go do it because I've spent, I've, I've developed a lot of time in that relationship. And what I kind of see us as, as wealth strategists at Paradigm Life of Being is not just the life insurance advisor, just the agent, right? We want to be the financial advisor that you can't get elsewhere, specifically an advisor that won't just talk to you about a few assets classes that is kind of in their narrow wheelhouse. We want to be the financial quarterback is what I say to my clients. We want to be that person who can help you talk about different aspects of your financial life and bring other team members on like CPAs and attorneys, but also these tier three um, you know, people who are running the tier three asset, sometimes called syndicators. Um, and, and we want to help you partner up with somebody like that, where it's an ethical individual, at least that, that we know to be ethical, right? And so we have strategic partners like that. And I think it's also important to say that at Paradigm Life, we don't, you know, we call these individuals strategic partners, but across the spectrum, whether it's attorney, CPA, or somebody that's raising funds, we don't have an affiliate paid relationship with them. And it's super important that we don't have that. Because you, you can understand or you can, you can feel that our, our interests are aligned with yours, right? It is not that we're going to steer in one direction because it, we have an incentive to do so. So I've had a great experience with, with Tier 3. Maybe just maybe throwing out some ideas of what Tier 3 is, right? So a mobile home park, a large apartment building, um, maybe a fund for lending out for doing rehabs and things like that. Or... But it, it really could be syndicating anything. I have a friend who's syndicating um, poppy farms down in, in Panama and, um, and chocolate farms in Belize or syndicating single family homes. So maybe you don't want to go and buy a single family home yourself, but you wouldn't mind participating in a group of 10 single family homes, right? So it's, it's people who are putting together funds and you're more of a limited partner in that, in that environment. So that, that's some of the things that I talk a lot with clients about, but it is, it is a place where a lot of people need to operate or feel they need to operate, and I kind of agree with them. Well, first of all, if your number one asset is yourself and you believe what, what we believe at Paradigm Life, that you're the number one asset, and then if you end up with a business, right? So if you're the number one asset and you're performing at a high level, you're either a highly paid W-2 uh, employee or executive and about as busy as you want to be in the professional life, or you're running your own business and you're just as busy. So if you have your expertise nailed, if you're actually working on unique genius in the tier two level, that's about all you need in tier two, right? I have single family homes. 
but it started to get busy for me. Like I may go own my own mobile home park one day, but it, it's going to, um, I'm not going to do it at the scale that I thought I was going to do when I first started because tier two can really drag you away from what I think the most important tier two is, which is working on yourself, the number one asset and um, your business. Well, tier three is one of those, one of those interesting uh, ideas because I would say most, you know, most investors, most passive investors, right, have some form of of tier three or tier or tier four, and you know, as you were as you were speaking, I think relationship is definitely a, a dynamic that will, uh, you know, make or break a tier three type of uh, investment. But as I as I look at you know how we've done this series, there there's always a, a, a return associated with the money you put into the specific tier, right? So in the foundational tier. Right, which is your safest a- safest assets? What we specialize in, okay? You you have essentially the highest return with the most, uh, I would say, uh, features, right? Benefits, okay, uh, than anything else that's out there, right? And that's why you know we, we've chosen that for for tier you know for tier one, tier two, right? A, a return comes from personal development. It comes from uh, you know having uh, a, a return associated with the money you invest in yourself, right? That I think is infinite. Uh, but you also have some, you know, collateralized type of investments there that you control and and have to, as you were mentioning, uh, spend some time and effort and and work with. But there's a return associated with that. You get money, you get money back, you get cash flow. There's a degree of certainty there as well because you know typically with single family homes, you know if if you're buying them the right way, even though you may have market dips and, and dips and fluctuations, okay, you're it's a it's an asset that performs uh, well. I mean, a lot of things have to go sideways. Uh, for it not to perform well, but then you get into tier three, right? And the idea is that you give up, you know, the con- you give up control, right? But you still want the highest return, highest return possible. But what's interesting is that, you know, sometimes when you're in a tier one or a tier two, like the re- the returns that you can get in like a wealth maximization account, when you factor in fees and volatility uh, and uh, and taxes, right? It's like they sometimes it sometimes outperforms some tier three investments, right? Tier four investments. So what it comes down to is, you know, the the risk that you're taking by giving up control, there has to be a compensation for that risk, right? There has to be, and that compensation is essentially uh, a, a return. Now, obviously, understanding the investment, having education there, uh, is one thing. That's a way in which you minimize risk and understand, right? That best case scenario, here's my return. Worst case scenario, here's my return. Here, things go go sideways. Like you have that knowledge in advance, but essentially, there's this marginal, you know, I would say marginal benefit in most tier three investments. Okay, and that's where I look at it. It's like you're better off putting money in, you know, tier two or tier tier one. But looking at tier three is where you know you want to understand that hey, I'm I'm giving up control, but then I want you know obviously a lot of upside associated with that. So how do you usually uh, weigh that? Right, weigh that. Hey, I'm taking additional risk. Where am I getting the reward for that for that risk? How do you typically weigh and, and, and assess that? You know, most of the time it is about being able to participate in a preferred return plus equity. Um, so that's that's kind of the real estate model, self storage, mobile homes, things like that. You know, the the alternative when it's when it's real estate side. Uh, there's a lot of other things out there that um, I, I haven't really played very much with, but uh, you know, I, I see the. If you can get a preferred return, a, a decent preferred return, you know, seven percent or eight or nine or something, then and get um, and get an opportunity for appreciation. There's a lot of things that you can do on the larger scale, or that the syndicator can do on a larger scale with different types of loans, agency type loans or commercial loans, that can provide a really decent return at the end, a kind of a pop on the on the cash out refi. For example. It takes a lot longer for me with my single family homes to get to a position where I'm kind of an infinite return, where I've pulled out all the equity of what I put in. Now I could force equity, right? I could I could flip my own or not flip, but I could do my own rehab and then cash out refi that. But again, you're shifting your focus away from your your business, your primary kind of calling, and that's going to cost you every time you do that. So um, the idea to be able uh, to have the preferred return while you're building, while they're building the equity, forcing the equity, that's not you personally doing it. And then being able to refinance out your cash and go do it again. That's, that's where I like that. So that, to me, the, the more um, straight path or well-worn path towards infinite return, I guess, to use Robert Kiyosaki's term, where you can refinance out the investor dollars and still get cash flow from it. 
that's really what I like about, about tier three. But again, the other thing I love about tier three is that it allows you to focus on unique genes. The thing that inspires me is that we want to help. I mean, my, I say that my, my job in life is to help people put in place a pyramid where tier one is handled, right? That is our expertise, of course. Um, but then they can, that enables them to focus on a tier two and build something that's going to add tremendous value to the rest of the world. And if they're doing that in tier two, um, you know, my single family homes, what did that do for me? It allowed me to play at a smaller level, to learn things at a pretty low level, um, that, you know, without a lot of risk so that I could apply it then to what I'm doing in tier three. But my primary right, focus explain, is explain that, that I think that's a, I think that's a huge piece, Gary with what you just said. Can you yeah. explain that further? How you, you know, the knowledge and experience and what you gained by owning, you know, 20 single family residences that allowed you to better assess, better analyze, better understand tier three and the value associated with that. How did, how did one, yeah. uh, I would say, spill into the other as far as making a tier three investment a wise decision? Yeah, absolutely. So if you, just get in, get in an Uber car, right? And you're riding around in the back seat, right? You, you've not experienced what driving's like. You don't understand um, what's going on in the head of the person who's running. It. So, what is it like when when the governor stands up and says your renters don't have to pay? Like I had a different perspective than a lot of the people who just invested for the first time in an apartment building, and all they knew before that was their mutual fund, right? And uh, I understood. I knew the, what, what questions to ask. I knew what questions to ask before I got into the investment with the syndicator because I'd been through that. So understanding the demands that happen when you have to evict somebody or when, um, when rehab's coming or what kind of questions do you ask when the tenants and toilets events happen, you know, when the repair has to happen. Um, you know, knowing that it makes sense to be in an, an environment that doesn't have bad weather conditions or that, um, that the value of setting up your rents so that they all happen around the May, June timeframe. And then again, in September around the school year, just a lot of stuff that I didn't know before I started investing and the whole concept of being win-win with your, the other people on your team, like squeezing the property manager, it doesn't work long-term it, it, you know? And so those are the kinds of things I don't think you learn if you just jump right into tier three. Um, the other thing, Pat, that isn't really related to that is, the, the primary reason that I did the single family homes is because I was convinced in 2011, 12, 13, and I'm still convinced that the actions we're taking is going to result in inflation. And I had this core thing in my being from when I was a teenager about what high inflation can do to your wealth. Uh, and so when I saw us starting to print in 11, 12, 13, 14, I said, gosh, I want to offset that. And, and so I believe the biggest value of the single family homes and the direct investments is your ability to lock in that equity and, uh, and hold it for many, many years. It would be hard to find a tier three investment where the plan is to hold it for 30 years, right? I mean, it's just not going to work. They're all short term because some of the investors need out. So when you buy a bunch of properties and lock that stuff in for 30 years, offsetting inflation, I think it's a tremendous asset. And the, and the one, again, the trade-off is really important because that's, that's essentially what you uh, learned and what you started to value because the trade-off is you don't have to do property management in tier three. Uh, you, you know, don't have to uh, assess the deal. Uh, you don't have to really make decisions. You're relinquishing that right to, to someone else, someone that has uh, a tremendous amount of experience. But you know that someone that, as you said, goes in with maybe a, a, a REIT understanding or a mutual fund understanding, they get into, you know, these type of private syndicated deals, it, they're not going to va necessarily value what the, uh, the, the provider, okay, the, the, the general partner is going to do for you and obviously charge, uh, charge fees for that. So it's one of those assessing it, uh, but also valuing it is, uh, is really important. So for you, you know, maybe as we mm -hmm. kind of wrap wrap things up, you know, when you, you you already mentioned one way in which you do due diligence, okay, through through relationships, looking at what they've done in the past. What are other other things that you've done that uh, have been successful when it comes to due diligence? And maybe if you know of uh, a uh, maybe a failure in a syndication that was the result of not doing uh, good due diligence. Yeah, so certainly my very first syndication that I, I participated in the first, uh, let's use the first two. So one was one was a medical office building. 
And I went in with the desire. The, the reason I, I got into this deal is because I had a quick relationship built with one of the one of the members, and uh, one of the people who were working on the project. And it was near my home, or it was like on my drive home when I used to work in D.C. all the time and come home on the weekends. Um, and I didn't really do due diligence. Well, I didn't do due diligence due diligence at all about the market. And a lot of things that were said were just complete. Um, they, they just didn't bear out. And so what resulted was the people were ethical, the business model was failed, and and so we're kind of stuck with this property right now. That's it's kind of paying its own bills, but I can't get out of it. And um, it's like the back, the lock, the doors are locked on the back of the car, you know. And and so the people were ethical, had the best of intentions, but I didn't study the market and I didn't study the business plan. And frankly, I didn't know anything about the business plan. It was the only, it was the only commercial building I've ever been in. I didn't know what I was doing. So that's a lack of due diligence, right? Another one was in oil and gas. And on this one, um, I got kind of, uh, you know, to use Robert Helms is letting the tail wag the dog, the tax tail wag the dog. I was really suckered in on that one. And, um, and I made some assumptions like oil prices will never go down again. Um, but the big thing, though, the big lesson learned there was that I happened to be at an event where the the head guy was at, I think Pat Donahoe might have been there too. And I had this interaction with a guy where I realized his values are not too solid to be specific about it. He was a married guy who was paying too much attention to a single young lady who was at the event. And I did not, I mean, I, I saw it, I felt it. I'm like, well, that's his personal life. You know, I didn't know any better at the time. So those are a couple where they didn't, they did not go well. Things that I have learned, um, on the positive side, they've all been, I think this is true in life, they've all been when uh, bad things happen. So, you know, bad things are, we always call them bad, but it's our choice to call them bad. But the learning experience comes from when challenges occur. And in cases where I've been involved with individuals that I thought I was in, you know, I'd done the due diligence on the person, I'd done it on the deal. And well, COVID-19 is a classic example. After everything I've learned, um, I'm in different deals now than I was when I, you know, when I started 10 years ago, and it was a totally different experience here during COVID-19. The communication was exceptional from the leaders, from the syndicators, when we had the problems associated with maybe the tenants aren't going to pay their rents, uh, and and the properties had a whole bunch of, you know, capital sitting in the background. So that I think is kind of a full circle, making different decisions and and just seeing right now the, the what happened, you know, the experience um, of, of how it's better working with people that you know. You know, for me, the biggest thing is, is it a good person that I'm working with, right? That's the biggest. But the next is, do they communicate? Are they okay telling bad news? Because bad news does not get better with time. And so if you're in a case with a, you know, if, if you're in, in, a, in a partnership or you're in a syndication as a limited partner, and the people are willing to tell news quickly. So I guess my biggest lesson learned would be talk to, get ref referrals, and ask for a referral from a situation that didn't go well, just like the question you asked me. And ask those people, did they communicate with you? Because it's the worst thing in the world when uh, you're in something, your family's money's in it, and you stop talking to you. I mean, keep delivering me bad news. That's okay. Don't stop talking to me. Well, here are a couple of pieces that I'm taking from that. First off, when you're in Tier 3, where I think a personal financial situation uh, is destined for disaster is when the bulk of assets are in these type of investments, right? That's where when yes. things do go sideways, right? There isn't cash, there isn't liquidity. Uh, and that obviously impacts emotions and emotions impacts logic. And now even the way in which you earn money is most likely negatively affected. So I look at, you know, tier three, there's a role and the role is, you know, after tier one and tier two. And in that role, the returns are higher. It's much more passive, but you relinquish uh, control. Now, when you relinquish control to somebody else, okay, I, I definitely think that, you know, sometimes the past is an indicator of what's going to happen in the future. Now, from, you know, a speculation standpoint, that's one thing. But I think from a behavior standpoint, that's another. Uh, you know, there's a part of our, our hiring process where, you know, we, we inquire uh, within, you know, the legal boundaries of you know what a person was like during formative years, during uh, youth, during you know times in which significant decisions were made about who they are and what their values are, and you can detect patterns. And I think that is definitely the case when it comes to uh, business, right? Because it's not just syndicating and experience in syndicating, but it's just it's just business in general. 
and there is a good way of doing business and there's not a good way of doing business. And I think if you identify those, now you can ask better questions, make better assessments. And in the end, are you going to have a perfect investment out there? You're, you're not. Okay? At the same time, there definitely has to be more pros checked than cons. And so I look at, you know, Gary, and maybe you can t- take the final word on this as we wrap, wrap things up. You know, but you look at the role of, of these type of investments and, you know, I would say the end result is what we try to speak to the most, right? As well, strategists implementing a personalized wealth strategy is what's the end result that you, that you want? What are you trying to achieve? And really having clarity around there for the client now allows them to, you know, understand where their financial situation is and what they need to do in order to achieve that end result, both from a uh, saving their income, making more income, uh, but then also the investments that they're participating in. So as you get to tier, you know, to tier three, this is where, you know, I would say emotions are somewhat heightened and the emotions of, uh, you know, greed and gain, not to say that they're bad, they're just natural emotions. And it's being able to, I would say, uh, curb them in a sense by incorporating some good practices of logic, whether that's asking good questions, whether that's, uh, like you said, uh, finding referrals, okay, getting the experience of others, and not necessarily just what's gone right, but also what, what did they do when things went wrong? That's a huge, if you can get those type of referrals, man, in and of itself, them giving you that type of person to talk to, right, is a good sign. Okay, let alone the experience of actually speaking to them and what happened when things did not go according to plan, which, you know, barring their intentions, and if they're genuine and so forth, doesn't mean that, you know, they have business wherewithal and know how to operate when things do go, you know, uh, they don't go according, according to plan. So Gary, with that being said, I mean, I, this has been a great conversation. I know you have a ton of experience in that tier three world. What, what, you know, what would you end with and, and maybe express or reemphasize in relation to tier three as it pertains to someone's personal financial situation? I think what I would do, Pat, is I would put tier three in perspective back on the pyramid. So we cut it down. We talked about it a lot, but I would put it back into perspective. The, the, um, my business uh, and my personal life were amazing during this COVID-19 period, during this, and it's not about the COVID-19, like I, uh, you know, people out there have, have actually, you know, had been tremendously affected by the, the condition. What I, what I really meant is the economic fallout that occurred from all of the stopping of work in America. Um, and I, what I attribute that to, my realization during this, my learning through, the, through this three-month period of time was the reason that, that the business did okay is because I was looking for opportunities, not crises. And the way you do that is if you, you have a clear mind, right? Like if you're afraid that the saber-toothed tiger is coming at you as a prehistoric man, right? You're not going to be using that part of your brain that is the developed intuitive brain. You can't be seeing the opportunity. And for me, what that was, was I happened, somewhat dumb luck, wandered into March of 2020 with a decent amount of money sitting on the sideline that I was planning to put to work in the near future. And that gave me so much confidence, having so much, having an enlarged kind of tier one of the pyramid gave me clarity of mind. I remember having a conversation where I said, well, what happens if all these tier two assets don't pay? Is tier two going to cause the entire pyramid to come down? And the fact that we had a solid tier one meant that that was just not going to happen in a reasonable time frame. And it allowed me to focus on the most important thing in tier two, which was my own business. So tier three, um, you, have to, you have to do it with ethical people. You have to do some. You have to do considerable amount of due diligence about good times and bad times, um, and you need to make sure there's good exit strategies, right? That's one of the things about being in the back seat as a passive investor is you don't. There's one exit tra- strategy, and that's whatever the syndicator thinks is going to be the exit. Mm-hmm. If you're buying a single family home, you can sell it to somebody who wants to live in it. You can sell it to your current tenant. Sell it to your mother if she wants to become, you know, a real estate investor. So there's lots of options and lots of people that can play on that level. Um, that's why, again, I would not jump directly to three. The purpose of three is just to allow your little soldiers, your money, to go to work and maybe earn a little bit more in those times when you don't need them down on the foundation. And its purpose is to free you up to be in tier two. That was How's a great that? summary. No, <laughs> that was a perfect summary, Gary. Thank you for for wrapping it up so well. Well, Gary, it's been awesome. It's always an honor to to speak with you and to and to learn from you. And I hope the audience uh, has as well. Thank you again, my friend. I know that this is, I think, your third appearance or fourth appearance on the Perpetual Wealth Going uh, for podcast. So, hey, <laughs> we, need, we just need to keep stacking those up. 
So we'll have you on next time. Hey guys, thanks for joining Gary and I on today's episode. The show notes as well as the resources that we discussed in the episode are available on the podcast page, which is at paradigmlife.net. So make sure you go check that out and bookmark it. And there's one more. There's one more episode with this specific season where we focus exclusively on the hierarchy of wealth. And the next episode is is on uh, tier four assets. So we'll talk to you then. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Perpetual Wealth Strategy Podcast. Be sure to visit the show's official page at paradigmlife.net for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Guest opinions are their own. If you require specific investing, financial, legal, tax, or any other specialized advice, please consult an appropriate professional or a wealth strategist at Paradigm Life. We welcome and appreciate reviews of the show. Head on over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave your review today. And don't forget to subscribe to the show to get access to every new episode and its exclusive content. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time.